In this video, we'll take a look at a piece of vintage Heathkit test equipment, the IG18 Sine Square Audio Generator. I'll discuss the history and features of the instrument, and we'll look at the front panel controls and inside circuitry. I'll discuss the restoration of this particular unit and say something about the circuit design it used. We'll see a demonstration of the generator in operation and then wrap things up with a summary. Heathkit was a manufacturer of electronics in kit form. Their product line included amateur radio, test equipment, and various consumer products. By building a piece of electronics, you could save money and gain the satisfaction of having assembled it yourself. A signal generator is a device that produces repetitive signals which are useful for various types of testing of electronic devices. They're often classified as audio signal generators which produce output over the audible range of frequencies and radio frequency or RF signal generators which produce signals at radio frequencies. Signal generators can produce different signal waveforms, the most common being sine, square, ramp and triangle waves, with some generators able to produce arbitrary waveforms that are programmable by the user. The Heathkit IG18 is an audio sine square generator. It's useful for testing radio and audio electronics. It can produce both sine and square waves over a range of 1 Hz to 100 kHz. Like most Heathkit products, it was sold as a kit that was assembled by the user. It was made from 1969 to 1977 and introduced at a price of $95.95. My 1976 Heathkit catalog listed at a price of $84.95. A factory assembled version, the SG18A, was identical other than a slightly different paint color at a price of $130. The IG18 replaced the older tube type model IG82 sine square generator. It was replaced in 1977 by the IG5218 which only differed in cosmetics, the case color and knobs, and was sold until 1990, almost up to the time that Heathkit exited the kit business. The Heathkit IG18 Sine Square Audio Generator can produce sine waves from 1 Hz to 100 kHz. Output is adjustable in 8 ranges from 0 .003 to 10 volts. A meter indicates the output level calibrated in both volts and decibels. It can produce square wave signals from 5 Hz to 100 kHz with three output level ranges 0.1, 1 and 10 volts. Frequency is selected using front panel switches for 0 to 100, 0 to 10 and times 1, times 10, times 100 and times 1000 multipliers with a separate 0 to 1 vernier control. The sine and square wave frequencies are identical and the level of each is independently adjustable. Both signals may be used either independently or simultaneously. The sine wave output has a switchable 600 ohm load. Sine wave distortion is less than 0.1 percent from 10 Hz to 20 kHz and the level is flat within plus or minus 1 dB from 10 Hz to 100 kHz. The square wave rise time is less than 50 nanoseconds. Frequency is accurate to within plus or minus 5% of the first and second digits. It can be wired to run from 120 or 240 volts AC power. Compared to many basic audio signal generators of the time, this was quite a high-end unit with better specifications and more features, making it suitable for laboratory use. The unit uses the same size and style of case as many other Heathkit instruments of this era. The rear panel has only the three wire power cord with a facility to wrap the cord for storage. There are four rubber feet on the bottom and pull out carrying handles on the sides. The front panel has the following controls. The power switch with power indicated by a neon lamp a switch for the selectable internal 600 ohm load. It's only used for the sine wave output and not available on the two highest output level ranges. A meter which indicates the output level of the sine wave output in volts, RMS and decibels or DBM. The level has to be scaled by the output level range. 
So for example, it indicates 0 to 10 volts on the 10 volt range and 0 to 1 volt on the 1 volt range. The two sine wave output terminals, the sine wave output level control. The coarse adjusts selects one of eight ranges and the fine adjust controls it continuously from zero to maximum. The square wave output terminals and ground. The square wave output level control. Coarse adjusts one of three ranges and fine controls it from zero to maximum. The output frequency is set by four knobs. They're knobs for tens, ones, and variable zero to one, which are multiplied by the multiplier switch, which supports times one, times ten, times a hundred, and times a thousand ranges. For example, when the multiplier is set to one, ten set to fifty, one set to six, and zero to one set to zero point four, the generator will output 56.4 hertz. With the multiplier set to 1,000, 10 set to 20, so 1 set to 3, and 0 to 1 set to 0 0.4, the output would be 23,400 hertz. The highest possible setting is 111,000 hertz, and the lowest approach is 0. Circuitry is contained on two printed circuit boards one for the power supply and one for the generator circuitry proper. The circuit boards are single-sided, phenolic, and silk screened. There are switches above and below the PCBs with wiring and some components on the switches. The power transformer is also mounted on the chassis. The original unit would have come with two test leads with a banana jack on one end and an alligator clip on the other. Mounted on the back of the meter is a modification that I'll discuss later. The unit is all solid state using no integrated circuits, only diodes and transistors. The power supply uses two silicon diodes, a Zener diode, and a power transistor and produces a regulated 43 volts. The generator board uses eight transistors. The oscillator uses a differential amplifier oscillator where frequency is controlled by a notch filter with values determined by the frequency control settings. The sine wave section uses a voltage amplifier, emitter follower, power amplifier, and output attenuator switch. The square wave section uses the same oscillator followed by a Schmidt trigger, emitter follower, and power amplifier, and output attenuator switch. The design uses the common trick of using an incandescent lamp to stabilize the output level. It acts as a temperature dependent resistor in the feedback network. The idea dates back to the late 1930s and was used in Hewlett Packard's first product, the HP200A audio signal generator. There are four potentiometers which need to be adjusted during calibration. The calibration procedure requires an AC voltmeter and optionally an oscilloscope. In 1971, an article called The Greening of the IG-18 was published in the Audio Amateur magazine. It described a number of modifications to the IG-18 to improve the frequency accuracy and reduce distortion. Some of the modifications involving component value changes were incorporated by Heathkit in later versions of the kit. One of the larger modifications that Heathkit did not adopt was additional circuitry for isolating the meter from the oscillator and damping low frequency oscillations in the meter reading. The company Data Professional sells an IG-18 modification kit that includes all the parts needed to make most of the modifications from the article. It contains replacement parts as well as a small printed circuit board for the meter amplifier that's installed on the back of the meter. The modifications to the IG-18 itself are minor and can easily be reversed if needed. I purchased this kit and applied the modifications. Some of the mods had already been incorporated by Heathkit. The larger filter caps in the power supply were not one of the Heathkit modifications. I also installed the meter amplifier, which involves removing one of the trimmer pots on the PCB and connecting three wires. I do not have an instrument for measuring distortion, but it's reported that with the mods, the typical distortion is below 0.03%, which is much better than the Heathkit spec of less than 0.1%.
I received this unit in September of 2014 from a generous person who offered it to me for the cost of shipping, provided that I make a YouTube video about it. He also gave me an IM1212 digital multimeter that I've covered in another video. I was told that both units came from Pittsburgh State University in Pittsburgh, Kansas. The unit came well packed and double boxed and looked to be in decent shape. It was complete but came with no manual or test leads. There was a hole drilled in the top, presumably for access to one of the calibration pots. Someone had written in pen on the bottom of the case PCT12682, presumably a date of repair or calibration in 1982, and the technician's initials or possibly Pittsburgh College Technology. Two of the rubber feet had come off but were in the box. These were stick-on adhesive feet and often came loose. I glued them back on with contact cement. I could hear a loose screw rattling around. It turned out to be inside the meter. Opening the unit up, it looked clean inside. I initially powered it up slowly using a Variac. It powered up and seemed to be producing output at about the right frequency, but the output was pulsating or motorboating at a low frequency. I found several copies of the manual on the internet, including a full manual with assembly instructions. Restoration started with some cleaning. There were no obvious problems with missing, modified, or damaged components. I removed the residue of what looked like an asset sticker on the back, as well as some old masking tape. Even using Goo Gone, I was not able to get all of the masking tape residue off. The tape dries out and becomes hard to remove. This one could have been on the unit for decades. The meter was opened up and the screw that had come loose was reinstalled. I performed the initial resistance checks as per the manual and then went through the calibration procedure using an AC voltmeter and oscilloscope. The problem I observed with pulsating output was the unit being out of adjustment and went away after calibration. Everything looked good as far as output levels and amplitudes. I did notice that the sine wave output levels did not seem right at some of the attenuator switch settings. Going through the assembly steps in the manual and carefully comparing them to the wiring of the attenuator switch, I found that one wire connection had never been made. The corresponding switch lug was also not soldered. This corrected the problem. The unit must have had this problem since it was built around 40 years ago and no one ever noticed or fixed it. I ordered and received the IG-18 mod kit from Data Professionals. Some of the mods to the unit itself were already made as they were official changes by Heathkit, including a cap and resistor change and the type of potentiometer used. I did install the larger filter caps in the power supply. The small circuit board for the meter was assembled, mounted on the back of the meter, and hooked up to the generator board. This circuit makes the meter and output level more accurate by reducing air caused by loading of the circuit and dampens movement of the meter at low frequencies. The other mods reduce distortion of the sine wave output. Let's take a look at the unit in operation. I've connected the sine and square wave outputs to each channel of a dual channel oscilloscope. We turn it on and can see it power up almost immediately. The sine wave output level can be controlled by the attenuator using the eight ranges and fine control. The meter shows the output level as it's changed by the fine control. It doesn't change with each range as it scales depending on the range. The meter is calibrated so it's reasonably accurate. In order for the output level displayed on the meter to be accurate, the unit either needs to be connected to a high impedance load or the internal 600 ohm load needs to be turned on and the unit terminated in a 600 ohm load. The square wave output has three output levels as well as a fine adjustment. The output level is not shown on the meter. Both outputs produce the same frequency. Here I have it set for one kilohertz. The tens and ones controls allow us to directly dial the frequency we want and the zero to one control provides fine control. The multiplier scales it. For example, turning the tens control selects two kilohertz, three kilohertz, four kilohertz, and so on. 
using the multiplier set for a thousand we can switch in multiples of 10 kilohertz. Here it is set for 111 kilohertz. On the low end we can go down to 1 hertz or even lower. The level of output distortion is only guaranteed for sine waves down to 10 hertz. The output is DC coupled and the unit cannot handle being connected to DC voltages. If this is the case, it should be coupled to the unit under test through a capacitor. The output also should not be shorted on the highest output ranges. The manual has several pages of applications information such as testing audio amplifiers for distortion and measuring gain. The square wave output is useful for measuring the frequency response of amplifiers. It can also be used in conjunction with an oscilloscope to make frequency measurements using Lissajou waveforms. Many Heath kits, especially ham radio equipment, had various modifications published. In some cases, like the HW7 transceiver, entire books of mods were written. I generally avoid modifications as I like to keep the equipment original, but in this case the modifications seem to substantially improve the instrument while still being reversible if needed. The IG-18 was a high quality instrument. It was particularly useful for audio amplifier testing. It was sold from 1969 to 1990 with only cosmetic changes to the case and knobs. No doubt many were sold over this period. You can learn more about signal generators and other test equipment in my book Classic Heathkit Electronic Test Equipment. The book covers Heathkit's test equipment products starting with a brief history of Heathkit, an overview of the test equipment product lines, and tips on buying and restoring vintage test equipment from sources like eBay. Separate chapters cover the major categories of component testers and substitution boxes, frequency counters, meters, oscilloscopes, power supplies, signal generators, tube testers and checkers, and miscellaneous test equipment. Each chapter includes one or more in-depth sections that looks at a representative model from the author's Heathkit collection covering its features, operation, and notable quirks or trivia. The book is available from lulu.com and Amazon and retails for US $19.95. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please check out my other YouTube videos on vintage radio and test equipment.